All right, well, this morning, welcome, Jeff. We've got a special service coming up, or section of the service. Thank you, Emma. Good morning, everyone. So good to be with you. I have just returned from uh, a week in India, which is always something that you endure rather than enjoy. I think this time around, uh, they lost my luggage for three days. So I had uh, three days of the, the five or six I was there. I was just living out of my little carry-on luggage, which fortunately I had a change of underwear in, so that was, uh, that was helpful. But it does make it difficult when you haven't got anything else, it's just a good thing you go to a motel room and they've got a toothbrush there and a comb you can use, uh, which is good. And then also um, in the middle of uh, Secunderabad, uh, while I was there, I think they cut my phone off so I didn't have phone service for a while, and then I think one of the credit cards got cancelled because they thought I was overseas when I shouldn't have been, even though we told them I was. And uh, then we had ATMs that wouldn't work. It was one of those trips that you just think, wow, what else can actually go wrong? But uh, it was good seeing what Kate and Jonathan are doing firsthand, and they'll be back sometime next weekend, I think, or maybe the weekend after. We'll get them to give a little report also of what it was like over there. Let me add my welcome to Emma's. Uh, to visitors here, and especially people online. It's great to have you joining us today. Ballina Shire Council has just finished installing a new children's playground in Wardell. Brand new, spanking children's playground. They've got some equipment there, and they dug out a whole heap of stuff, and, and they, they filled it with softball. It's a really good, safe playground. Lots of soft bark in case someone falls over. Lots of activities that have minimal risk. Everything is safe and soft and suitable for our young people. And isn't that a good thing nowadays, that our young people have it so safe in the whole of your things? But playgrounds weren't always like that. Back in my day, children could damage themselves pretty badly using a public playground. I think our first photo, if we can pop that first photo up, Sarah. Yes, uh, there we are. Back in my day, that was a serious playground. <laughs> could you hurt yourself on that playground? Absolutely you could. You could probably do some serious permanent damage to yourself back in the day. That's what, that's what we let our kids play on. I can also remember uh, over near Shores Bay, where the old, does anyone know where the old kiosk was there? They had a big slippery dip that I used to love as a, a little kid. And uh, this is not the exact slippery dip, but it was exactly like that. It was like 15 feet high, it had no guardrails, no fencing, no soft fall. If you fell off the, the top up there, you'd crash over the side and you'd break something. And uh, you would scramble to the top and the, the kids all lined up, so you just all go one rung at a time and nudging people out of the road. You get to the top, then you'd throw yourself off the top of the slippery dip, whiz down to the bottom and plough into the lake. The kids that were around the bottom, down the neath. Yes. <laughs> Especially when it got a bit rusty or the, without in the sun, uh, really hot in the sunshine. Or who can remember Lake Ainsworth, which had a two-storey diving tower built out of timber? Now, this is actually Lake Ainsworth. I remember as a boy going and climbing up that thing. And there was like, a, that's not bad. Sometimes it would just be covered with people and being shoved off and pushed off and, and everything. So that's, I think they took that down because that was unsafe as well. And then who remembers back in Shores Bay in Ballina, they had an even taller diving tower that's in Shores Bay where those steps are now. And you can just see the edge of the tower and people would go up to the top of that and dive off from there. They were different days back then. Just going to the playground or the lake had risk involved. We've since discovered that risk is an important part of children growing up. It's an important part of people's lives. If we remove all rest, risk from their lives, and there's some certain things that don't take place in their world. Growing up as kids, I never had uh, video games, never had computer games, never had iPads or iPhones. There was no Facebook, there was no Instagram, and there was no TikTok, which seems to be the thing that a lot of our young people now are involved in. We had things like bicycles 
and we had our imagination. And on Saturdays, we wouldn't be playing video games. We would disappear on Saturdays with our mates and we would ride to a swimming hole that might be five or six or seven kilometres away. And when you get to the swimming hole, there was a, 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 there'd be a tree with a branch going out over the swimming hole and someone would have tied a rope to the end of the tree. And there would be a stick there that you'd hang on to and you'd swing out over the water and let yourself go. Uh, about 15 years ago, there was one of those at Lake Ainsworth I saw. And the kids, most afternoons, would be down there swinging out over the water until the council came along. Of course, they had to remove that risk. So they just cut the branches off that were hanging over the water and removed those. Back in my day, we would take our fishing lines to a new spot and try to catch fish. Or we would get in our boat, our rowing boat, and go exploring for hours on end up the river. In my mid-teenage years, one of my mates had a, had a paddock bomb. Do you know what a paddock bomb is? It's, a paddock bomb is an old car that you've got hold of. And uh, someone had a paddock and you'd drive the car round and round in the, in, in the paddock. And uh, we would go to my mate's farm and he had a paddock bomb there. And it was always breaking down and we were always fixing it up. And we often scared ourselves silly by going too fast in this old car. There was no seat belts, there was no helmets that we had on. It actually had no bodywork, it was just a chassis with a motor and the steering wheel coming back and a couple of seats tied down to the chassis that was there and we would go roaring around in that thing. I don't know how we survived. I don't know how we didn't kill ourselves. It was a different world back then. Today our children grow up in a risk-free environment. We want to keep them safe, but there also is a lot of valuable lessons that kids learn when they do something that has a little bit of risk involved in it. They learn from their mistakes. And it seems that an environment with no risk, coupled with the effects of hours and hours of social media, is changing the way our young people think about themselves and thinking about the world that they live in. I've been reading a, a book recently uh, by Jonathan Haidt. I think we've got a little picture of that to pop up on the screen. And it's called The Anxious Generation... How the Great Rewiring of Childhood is Causing an Epidemic of Mental Illness. He's talking about rising rates of anxiety with our young people and, and rising rates of, uh, of difficulties and mental anguish and mental difficulties that's taking place in children's lives because of this combination of a lack of risky play, a lack of risk opportunities and the vaccination and fixation with screens and with social media. He says the combination of those two is actually effectively rewiring the brains of our young people. He recalls on, it's a United States book, and he calls on research from the States. He says the average 8 to 12 year old in the United States spends five hours per day on screen time. 8 to 12, five hours per day. This is not including homework, time using a screen, or not including time at school using a screen. This is time outside of other activities where they're just simply fixated on their screens. But it goes up for students or people from 13 to 18 years of age. The research shows that they spend seven to eight hours on their screens every day. Seven to eight hours. And often when mum and dad think they're in better sleep, they're actually under the covers on their screens. They're doing all sorts of stuff. Seven to eight hours. No wonder there's no time for any risky play or on your bikes or whatever. This is uh, on social media and video games that they're spending their time. And they found this, that these young people spending all of this time on video games and social media, they found that their anxiety levels are significantly high. In actual fact, in the last 10 years, there's been a 200% increase in anxiety levels from students 10 to 18 years of age. A 200% increase. They found also that these young people, their social skills are not being developed. They don't know how to relate to people. They don't know how to have a conversation. They don't know how to do some of the stuff that we think is part of the socialisation process that happens in those years. They don't know how to relate to others. They've also found that these people have really poor quality sleep. They're not getting the sleep that they actually need and therefore they are not functioning properly during the day. They found that these young people have a short attention span and an inability to focus on things which are difficult. They're used to focusing on things that give them a little dopamine hit or give them some sort of reward. They've also found that around 10% of these young people show all the indications of a serious addiction. 
They have compulsive behaviour. They have withdrawal symptoms if they can't get hold of their screens. And they have a dependency on that activity for them just to feel like they're coping with life. 10% of them have an addiction. Jonathan Haidt says that these young people are being pulled away from the real world and they're being reshaped by their screens. Not shaped by the real world that we live in, but by the world that these screens present to them. They're missing out on learning relationship skills. And he says often the only relationship skills they learn are by watching uh, videos. And if it happens to be pornography, which a lot of them spend time doing, then they have no idea how to relate properly in the real world. They, uh, they, their interest in sport is being heavily influenced by gambling and sports apps. And they, they spectate for sport to see who's going to win or lose rather than participating in sport. They're finding that the rise of artificial intelligence in the last couple of years is blurring the lines further from what is real and what is not. And artificial intelligence presents itself as being real, but there's all sorts of fake stuff that now is being produced. Have you seen some of the dogs and cats on Instagram? dancing and clapping and they look like humans because artificial intelligence has been able to to reshape how we we see pets and how we see animals. And it's reshaping the sense of reality for our young people to the point where mental health and self-harm are the results uh, and are increasing at an alarming rate. That's the bad news. What's What's the good news? Well, Jonathan Haidt has also identified this emerging crisis in our young people And we've removed risk from their lives and we've allowed social media to shape their self-worth and their sense of purpose and their values. But he also identifies a number of solutions. And I'd encourage you, you can buy a copy of this book from Big W, I think, has it for about $24. And he gives lots of practical things that you can do from different age groups, things to get kids away from their screens and actually doing some other stuff. He has numbers of recommendations and ideas and suggested ways of making changes to young people's lives. And one of those ideas is the mitigating effects of spirituality. He said, if you can involve your young people, from children right through up to to teenagers, if you can involve them in spirituality, if you can somehow expose them to the reality, particularly of church spirituality, that regular church attendance, that regular engagement at church cancels some of the negative effects of social media. It cancels some of those effects. He says that coming to church and having our children and young adults engaging in church life is an antidote to the online process that happens to them. That being taught about Jesus and knowing his teachings has a positive effect on their sense of self-worth. They suddenly realize my value is not because how many likes I get on Instagram or how many likes my self-worth comes because I have a realization that Jesus actually loves me. That Jesus cared for me. That Jesus died on the cross for me. That I was important to Jesus. Therefore, if Jesus thinks I'm important, then that affects my self-image and my self-worth and how I feel about life. It has a positive effect on their self-worth. It gives them a sense of place and purpose in life. I see some of the young people running around there this morning and one comes past me and I put my hand on, how are you doing this morning? He goes, oh, you know who I am. I recognize, we recognize our young people. We recognize our teenagers. We recognize our children and we encourage them. And that, that happens in this church context where we come of a Sunday morning and we put aside a couple of hours of our time to participate in church together. Church gives a message to our young people that they are unique and they are valuable. And and gives them social values and a sense of accountability and an environment where they can engage with other people. They can engage with others. Jade and Bria and Phil. Jade looks after the younger kids and Bria looks after the primary kids and Phil looks after the teenagers. They do an amazing job. And I want to say that the job they do is they're not babysitting. They're not just filling in the time on Friday nights or Sunday mornings. They're not just here just doing something to, to fill the, uh, the, the children in, give the children something to do while we'll do real church out here. What they're doing is, I think, just as important, if not more important, than what we do out here as part of church. They're helping young people discover genuine Christian spirituality. Psalm 127 verse 3 says this, Children are what? A gift from the Lord. Our children are a gift. We have, I know they're annoying sometimes, 
but they're a gift from the Lord. And he entrusts them into our hands until we look after them. And, and it says in, um, in Proverbs 22, verse 6, it says, To train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. We have a responsibility with these children that God has placed in our care, both as individuals in terms of families, but us also as a church, that we are to train these children up. And even if they make some poor choices along the way, because we've trained them up in the house of God, there'll be some good stuff that's in their life. The message translation says this from Proverbs 22 and verse 6, Point your kids in the right direction, and when they are old, they won't be lost. Point them in the right direction. When we come to church on a Sunday, we're pointing our kids in the right direction. We're doing something which cuts across this strong social thing of living on your screens all the time, and we're giving our kids a place where they can find value in their world. I'm going to invite Jade to come up. Is Jade here? Or, uh, there she is. And just fill us in a little bit on what she does with, uh, with the younger ones in the church and something of the passion that burns in her heart. Thanks, Jade. Oh, sorry, yes. I'll just mute. Morning. Oh, sorry. Blast you. Good morning, everyone. Just while I am... Um Starting, I'll get my helpers to hand out a scarf to everybody. Um, yes, ooh, and um, risk-free scarf, Jeff. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if you can relate, but a lot of my childhood memories are pretty patchy. Um, but one of my earliest memories of church as a small child is heading on over to the sort of big wooden hall beside our church, and we'd have kid church there. We'd all sit in a circle in chairs and. We'd um, have a Bible story, do some colouring in and and then we'd maybe do some worship songs and I remember singing Stand Up For Jesus. Um, it's a fairly old hymn and we would all sit on the chairs and then when it got to the stand up, stand up, we'd all stand up and I have this very distinct memory of that and then getting a little book that we would every week get a sticker in. It was one of those lick and stick type stickers and, um, and it would have like a Bible verse and a little picture on it and... Um, and that was, they're good memories, they're safe memories for me, and even if they are a bit patchy, and they're the start of my walk um, to knowing God. And when I was um, a little bit older, I joined uh, an organisation called Girls Brigade, and I'm not sure if many of you have heard of it, but um, it was very popular in Casino where I grew up, and um, we had one of the biggest organisations in, you know, in Australia. There was like, I don't know, 80 girls or something attending, and um, it was kind of like a Christian version of Scouts um, run from a church. And we met weekly and we did all sorts of activities like sport and cooking and Bible crafts and camping. And um, the aim was to grow in our relationship with Jesus. And I had a lot of amazing leaders um, at Girls Brigade who spoke into my life and encouraged me in all sorts of um, ways. And I ended up continuing on all the way through to complete my Queen's Award, which was... Um, I think that was, I was in year 12 maybe and we went down to Government House and received an award from the Governor-General and it was, it was an amazing experience. And I'm, I'm really thankful for, first of all, a mum who prayed for me and, and with me and the positive teaching and encouragement of Kids Church and Sunday School as we, uh, and um, Girls Brigade. And um, those things have shown me how important it is to the trajectory of your life and how... Um, definitely it influenced me in having a passion for teaching little people about Jesus. Um, so hopefully you've all just about all got a scarf. Apologies if we didn't have enough. I had to make 150 scarves yesterday. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm just going to show you a little activity that we do in Kids Church. And Ruben, can you come up and hold my... Um... Oh, sorry, mate. Get you to come and hold the microphone, just so I've got hands free. Rue, can you come up? Thanks, buddy. Sorry, I'm getting him to multitask. Can you just hold it? All right, so I want you to grab your scarf and I want you to scrunch it up really tiny in your hand until you can hardly see it. Just try and hold it in your hand and then you'll have one hand free. And we're going to do a little song. So the song goes like this. A little seed from God to sow, a little soil 
to make it grow. A little sun, a little shower, a little wait, and then a flower. Oh, <laughs> look at all your beautiful, colourful flowers. <laughs> And we usually do that about three or four times because the kids really like that one. Thank you, mate. <laughs> so if you just keep your scarf on your seat, I'll collect those for the next time I need 150 scarves. <laughs> um, apart from giving you a taste of what we do in C3 Preschool, um, that song's a great illustration for Kids Church. Firstly, um, let's think about the seed we planted. It represents the kids. God gives us these kids to care for and nurture. There are around 400,000 species of flowers that grow from seeds, not to mention the varieties within those species. And like these flowers, each of the children that we care for and, and have um, will grow into a unique and important human with a mix of talents and gifts. And secondly, we have the soil. And that's the church, our church family, a place for people to be planted and to flourish. In Psalm 92 verse 12 and 13 it says, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree or a flower, and they will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. We want to provide the best possible soil for our kids to grow in so that they can flourish. A child's family is central to their spiritual growth and as Kids Church, we should be in partnership with and supporting families. We are in a mutual effort to raise spiritual, spiritually healthy individuals. Thirdly, we have the son or the son and teaching God's word. God's word is at the centre of what is taught in our Kids Church. I'm so excited to teach kids about the Bible and how much they are loved by God. Kids Church is not babysitting, as Jeff said. Our kids are more capable of being switched on spiritually for God than we give them credit for. Um, there are lots of people in the world who want to have a say in what our kids think and, and, and influence them. And we, it's imperative that we decide whose voice will be the loudest. Do we want them to grow up believing that the, what the world says about them or what God says about them? We want them to know they are created in the image of a loving God who wants to be in an eternal relationship with them. Okay, fourthly in the song was the shower. And I would say that is encouragement, love and nourishment from amazing leaders in a safe, healthy place. There's that word safe again, sorry Jeff. Um, but it's really important for us to be safe. Um, when you step into Kids Church, you're not merely serving to tick off your turn on a roster or fill a gap. You are there in the capacity of an encourager, a teacher, a mentor, a fun maker, a spiritual champion and a leader. Now, more than ever, our children need safe, solid, dependable adults to have their back for them and to help them know that they are valued and loved by the King of Kings. In terms of C3 preschool age, this is a key time to have positive experiences, stimulating those millions of connections that they're forming in their brains. It's the fastest time of development in the human brain when they're, when they're in that age group. It's a foundational time of learning, health and behaviour and it will continue, that good foundation will continue throughout your life and that's why great leaders and helpers are so important. And the fifth thing we had was waiting, time and effort. It takes time, energy and effort and a team to grow our kids into spiritual champions. We can't do it alone as parents and we can't do it alone as a church. We need to um, do it as a team. We need many hands cooperating to prepare the soil and to nourish the seed. Thanks. <laughs> Bria. I'm kind of a bit nervous because today I'm going to try and turn off this head of mine and go from the heart. So can I share passion with you? Are you okay with that? Um, go with me. So let's do a journey. The why. The why 
when I finished school, I chose teaching. Lots of avenues opened, but I grew up with a love of learning. I just loved to learn and find out everything I could. And I wanted to become a teacher because I wanted kids to love learning as well. I wanted to pass that love along. But throughout my life, I learned that it's not just learning. It's about learning the right things. Things that help you, equip you and resource you for life's journey. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I went through primary years. I went through high school and asked Jesus into my life at the age of 19. So I had all those formative years without God in my corner. He was there, but I just didn't know the role he would play. Life gets hard and not a single one of us can avoid that fact. Things are going to happen in our lives that we can't handle by ourselves or in our own strength. And do you know what? Secular strength just doesn't cut it. Good intentions, friends, family, even love isn't enough. If we're going to do more than just endure or do more than just get through life, we're going to need the spiritual, we're going to need the miracles, and we need the power that God gives his children to defeat the enemy. Because I don't think a single person here today can deny that the enemy is out there and he is prowling around looking for people to devour. He is doing his job. So the question is, are we doing ours? Are we using our gifts to serve others? Are we ready with an answer of hope? Are we looking not to our own interests, but to the interests of others? And are we telling the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord? Are we telling them about his power and about the wonders he has done? C3 Kids is about telling the incredible story of God's love for his people, his unfailing love love, his steadfastness, his unchanging nature, his creation. Over the seven years the kids are up there in C3 Kids Primary, we journey through the Bible in its entirety from Genesis all the way through Revelation so that they will learn how far God will go for each one of them and for each one of us. Because God made each of us unique. He made us for a purpose and he will never leave us. He sent his son Jesus to die for every single one of those kids upstairs but not just them he sent them for every single one of their friends and every single one of the child children that are out there in that community as our world becomes more secular in its approach it's going to be those kids upstairs who need to be firm in their faith and need to be firm in their beliefs because it will be them who are evangelizing to their friends sharing the hope that they have So I ask, are we playing our part in helping the future generations to be courageous, to be countercultural? Do they know the truth, believe the truth, and know how to share with grace and mercy, but also unwavering firmness? Do they believe God's word not to be a truth, but to be the truth? So many families these days don't attend church, don't have a church background. It's not just that they may not go, their parents didn't go. It's now becoming a generational thing not to have a faith background. Scripture in schools is something you choose to opt into. But if our kids here love God, if they love church, if they invite their friends, if they invite their family, the families come along. If we get the kids, we get the families. But then I want to sidestep for a moment and because I want to be a little targeted when I ask, are you playing your part? Is serving with C3 Kids or C3 Youth something God has been prompting you to step up and into? Have you been thinking maybe I could but then allow yourself to get distracted or listen to the excuses for why not or why not now? Because if that is you, I'd really urge you to push into what God is whispering to you and what he is asking of you. Perhaps you feel you're not skilled enough, you're not a teacher, you wouldn't know what to do. Well, I say we'll give you the resources, we'll come alongside you and God will use whatever you bring to speak into these kids' lives. He takes our mustard seed offerings and he grows the largest trees from them. Maybe you feel you've moved on. Kids' church was something you did when your kids were young. Well, Jade and I both have kids at uni that have moved out of home. I've got two 
flown out down to Sydney. That's where they live and one not far along. But kids' church, my passion for kids' church is more than it just being about my kids. It's all these kids of this church. It's all those kids out in the community who are yet to know and hear and believe that Jesus loves them and sees them. And I say, not on my watch. Not while I'm here on earth am I not going to play my part in the battle for these kids' salvation because it is a battle. And as Jade said, it's whose voice is the loudest. I want to play my part so the kids know how to put on the armour God has given them so that when the enemy does come, they will stand their ground. But it's also about the families. It's about you guys with children. I've been there. I know what it's like when you have the kids at that age trying to equip your kids to be in the schools that they're in, in the world that they're in, in the family homes that they go into. Sometimes it's even just the battle to get out the door in time and get to church. So my serving still in kids' church is not not just a part of helping my kids, but it's about coming alongside the parents of this church, alongside the families of the church and being there to support them in their journey. But you can all pause and take a deep breath because I do have a disclaimer. So it's okay. Some of you are going to be very relieved to hear that God does not call every one of us to teach kids. And there are many ways that God will use us to serve and play your part in being part of this church family. But I know without a doubt, God is calling some of you to join the C3 Kids Leaders team to step up, not just as a helper, but as a leader, maybe to lead once a month, maybe just to serve once a term. And how do I know this? Because God is building this church. I know you can see it. Our kids' church is rapidly growing. And we, when we started talking about what we're sharing here today, we had six leaders. We've now got a seventh, yay. <laughs> but that's total. We don't have enough leaders to cover the rosters of the two rooms. And you've read in your news study, you've heard us talking, we're bringing in a third group because we've reached capacity. We need this third kids' church room. I have 47 regular children that attend C3 Kids Primary, aged from 4 to 13. That's not including the occasional kids and the visitors. Jade has over 20 in the preschool room, not counting the occasionals and the visitors. And this has happened in the last 6 to 12 months. God is calling families here, and they are choosing to call C3 Ballina their home. And God is not doing this without a plan and a purpose. Do you believe that God provides generously all we need with plenty left over to share with others? Do you believe that God enriches us so that we can be generous to others? If God is calling you to be generous with service, if God is calling you to serve by leading in C3 Kids, now is the time to respond. We need you. C3 Kids need you. C3 youth need you. They get over 30 kids on a Friday night with Phil. We need the workers. We need the leaders. Let us not be a church that lets the harvest go to waste because the workers are few. If God is calling you, listen. Listen and respond. Let's do this together. Let's all do our part to strengthen the future generations. Amen. Fantastic. And uh, Phil was not able to be with us today, but if we watch the screen, he's recorded a brief video message for us. Why do I lead at C3 Youth on Friday nights at C3 Ballina? I do it because I feel like Jesus is calling me to serve. When I grew up, I was so fortunate to have amazing leaders in my area. They gave up their Friday nights and their time to create a space that the youth in our area could have a God encounter. And that's exactly what I had growing up. I went to youth on a Friday night and I had my Jesus encounter that changed me forever. I do youth at C3 Ballina because I want to create a space for the youth in our area, the kids in our church and the bigger youth to be able to come here and have their God encounter that is going to change them forever. Um, I always think about leaving a legacy in this world. What greater legacy do you think you can leave than 
serving Jesus, creating a space for you to come and encounter him, that's potentially going to change them forever. Um, I always think about my kids coming through our church. They're quite young. I want to create a youth group that in years to come, it is pumping, more pumping than it is right now, that they're going to go to youth and have a God encounter and I'm not going to be there because I'm not going to be cool enough that he's going to be this like really cool young leader leading it because they won't want me there. Um, I feel like it's really important in today's culture with the youth to have a space that they can come there, feel safe, be proud that they're following Jesus and we create that space for them. I feel like it's really important with having that space that we encourage no matter what your, your age is or who you are, that you should never underestimate what God can do through you in the community. So that's why I do youth. If you want to come and serve or help out, we cook dinners. There's a bus that picks all the kids up. Um, we have people come out and hang out with the kids on the night. Um, there's so many different little jobs that we need done. So please let us know. Um, hit Brea up, hit the team up, hit me up, and we'll see where you can surf. Phil, why don't we stand together this morning and uh, let's just pray. If, uh, if God's speaking to your heart about helping out, uh, in one of those three or four areas we've talked about, just go and see one of the leaders and say, tell me a bit more about what would be involved, what would that look like for me, and uh, let's together really make an impact and a change in the lives of our young people, a whole generation or two that can really be shifted and changed. So Father, we thank you for these areas of young people's lives that we've talked about the last little while. We pray that you would give us wisdom and give us insight and give us the ability to be able to bring the reality, spiritual reality, the reality of Jesus and of the Holy Spirit and of our Heavenly Father into the lives of these younger people. Lord, that they would be a generation who know you, who experience you and who walk with you each day. Lord, we thank you for the young people in our church. Lord, we pray for each and every one of you that they would have an encounter with you which is real and relevant to them. Lord, I thank you for the leaders that we currently have. And Lord, those who give up their time, Lord, I thank you for your blessing in their world. As they give out, Lord, I pray that you would give back to them in so many ways. And so, Lord, we commit this area now into your hands. Uh, be with us. Help us to navigate our way forward. Lord, we thank you for all you're doing in this church, in this place. Lord, now as we go, be with us, I pray. Watch over us and keep us safe in this coming week. And I thank you for your peace in each one of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Have a, have a great afternoon. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in church uh, next Sunday. God bless.